there still isn't a widely uh, available to-go coffee cup that can be recycled. I would say that the EU gradu graduate who solves that problem is going to make a fortune. Those bags of beans that you see in Starbucks stores all over the world are actually how the company began. I feel really happy. Um, the impact on, on, on myself and on the rest of the world from Starbucks is, is a very positive one. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us again to the series Learning from Leaders. We are extremely excited today to welcome Zev Siegel, the co-founder of Starbucks and startup mentor. And the, the entire session will be facilitated, as always, by Peter Van Am, uh, writer and author of Before I Was a CEO. Peter, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Luc. And it's good to be back, back with you for our next installment of the learning from leaders. And I think we're all super excited uh, to be welc welcoming with us the founder of a legendary company, uh, Starbucks, that is Zef Siegel. Zef is joining us from the place, I think, uh, we'll hear it in a minute, where it all started for that most famous coffee company, which is Seattle in Washington State on the West Coast of the United States. We'll be hearing from him in just a minute about how things are there. Before we start, I want to take the opportunity to do a quick shout out, if I may, look to Jesse Ackermans. Uh, who is actually the EU alumni who put us in touch with uh, Zef. She's been mentored by him uh, and was so kind to put us in touch. That's the power of the network. Thank you, Jesse, for doing that. And now over to the man that we've all uh, been waiting to hear from. Zef, how are you? It's, it's early in the morning there. Have you had your first coffee yet? I'm having my first coffee right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely excellent. Couldn't do any better for a uh, startup entrepreneur who's been active in coffee uh, m many years in your life. But let me ask you, Zef, and I hope the coffee is good, uh, uh, and I'm sure it is in Seattle, but how uh, are you otherwise? How is the situation in Seattle right now? Isn't there a, a crisis going on there too with COVID-19? Yes, uh, we have three crises here um, in Seattle. And uh, number one um, is COVID. Um, we are now at stage two here. Uh, for example, when I go out, I wear a mask, uh, but we can go out. Um, and uh, number two, we have um, a, a practically global uh, protest going on um, in reaction to uh, uh, excessive force used by police against people of color. And Seattle is one of the cities in the world where uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of activity. Uh, silent marches, um, there's an encampment, which is located two blocks from where I'm sitting. <laughs> wow. and, and then the third crisis going on is that the, we have a president who is not uh, being a leader right now, and it's very difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of challenges that you have to deal with, uh, both individually, of course, uh, when it comes to the public health crisis and, and uh, as a country and as a nation. You know, the, uh, maybe quickly before we do our uh, turn back into time, um, you know, when you mentioned the Black Lives Matter protests, and of course they are about police brutality, but also about um, the discrimination of uh, people of color in the, in the workspace and in every other part of society. I remember, I know, of course, that uh, you already left Starbucks um, long uh, before that was an issue. But I remember a, a few years ago, Starbucks was one of those companies who was criticized for not having enough diversity and uh, possible opportunities in the workspace. And on the other hand, got then um, some kudos because it reacted very heavily. And I think they even they closed all the stores worldwide to give a training uh, on how to fight the uh, yes, racism and discrimination. Uh, that was an amazing experience for me. Um, I was not uh, I was not part of the, of Starbucks during that time. That happened quite recently, um, uh, long after I had left the company. But um, there was an incident in Philadelphia in which a manager thought that two uh, African American men uh, were uh, loitering in the store. It turned out they were just waiting for someone <laughs> for a coffee. Or for, uh, for a uh, but she didn't know that, and uh, she was you know was in a part of Philadelphia that's very upscale, and she was nervous. 
Um, and so she asked them to leave, and that turned into uh, quite an incident, and uh, a media incident. And Starbucks, for a large corporation, did the most amazing thing. You described it. They closed all the stores in the United States. Imagine, that's 7,000 stores. Wow. Imagine giving up the income for an entire day in order to work on the problem. And so on that day, I went to uh, three Starbucks. There were three of them located within two blocks of where I'm sitting. Um, and that's, you can say that in many places in the world. Uh, <laughs> I think it's true. But uh, I went to see, and I looked in the door, the sign on the door said, we are closed for uh, an educational, a day of education about uh, uh, race and, and uh, bigotry. And inside, sitting around the t a table in each of the locations that I went to, was um, what appeared to be all of the employees, you know, 15, 20 people, and they were, had notes in front of them, and they were having a, what looked like a pretty deep conversation. I was amazed. Um, and yeah. as you said, uh, you know, for that, the uh, management of Starbucks got a lot of praise for reacting that way. Do, do you think now, because it's been, of course, a couple of years ago, do you think that that led to change uh, at Starbucks? And is there indeed, you know, sort of a hopeful future ahead then if, if you address these well, Starbucks, problems? Um, under the leadership of the longtime chairman, a 35-year chairman, Howard Schultz, um, has always uh, taken uh, positions that other corporations uh, didn't. Um, liberal uh, positions, especially having to do with human rights and in many countries, not just the United States. And um, progressive, it inclusive, uh, yep. yeah, progressive, inclusive, um, even uh, helping veterans get jobs. They had a special initiative uh, for uh, returning veterans um, uh, from the armed services uh, and giving them training and enrolling them as employees. That's pretty, pretty great stuff. And uh, it's just a company that has that reputation. But Although it comes from the heart, certainly from the heart of Howard Schultz, I mean, he really believes uh, in liberal causes. Um, it is also unbelievably good marketing. <laughs> so, right. I mean, this is corporate social responsibility of a high order. And that's, of course, one of the concerns that we see again now, of course, uh, with a lot of companies uh, that indeed have reacted very strongly, at least uh, publicly, uh, uh, to say that they're anti-racist and that they're going to do something about discrimination. But then indeed, the question rises again, is that indeed just a, a marketing uh, uh, play or is it sure. real and will it lead to structural changes? Are you hopeful? Oh, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> this is one of those uh, wonderful moments in which doing the right thing is actually good for business. So right. I expect a lot of corporations to make changes. It's something that, of course, is in your DNA, and now I'm going to make a segue into uh, the past because we're now in 2020, but it must be, uh, you know, half a century ago, almost uh, at least uh, a couple of decades that you started uh, the company. We want to know all about it, of course, and what you've done since. But your story, you're in Seattle, but your story doesn't really start there, does it? You're, you're actually born in, in, the, in the Midwest, I believe, in Detroit, Michigan, and then had a couple of early childhood years in New York as well. My, my parents uh, were both born in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, their three children, including me, I am the middle child, uh, were also born in Detroit, Michigan. However, my parents' parents, who are my grandparents, were all born in Eastern Europe, and they were, they were immigrants. So my parents are second generation, I'm third generation. Uh, my father was a concert violinist, uh, of a very high professional order. And um, after, see, in, in, late in the late 1940s, he decided that he should be based in New York City, which at that time was a center of classical music, one of the world centers. Right. And we, we moved in 1947 to New York, uh, to a suburb of New York City. Including you. So you. Everybody went. Uh, and... Um, then 10 years later, the same thing happened again. Uh, he was offered an incredibly good position in Seattle, Washington, and the family moved again. Um, and uh, frankly, all of us are really happy that he was offered that position in Seattle because it changed our lives in a wonderful way. Yeah. My mother was an educator. I uh, started as a, a teacher um, and um, <clears throat> eventually in Seattle, the land of opportunity, she was able to open a school that still exists. 
It's a school for children age uh, three to 11. The early uh, childhood education, uh, very important years, of course, and something that I think you also uh, have in your, not just your DNA, but it's also one of your passions, education, isn't it? I started out as a teacher, and before that, I worked in uh, camps for children uh, uh, when I was in high school and the first in years in college. Um, I've always been interested in other people, children included. <laughs> and right. uh, that's why we're talking, you know, you, uh, you and I, Peter, because of my interest in entrepreneurs. I'll get I my inner child uh, out uh, for the conversation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I find entrepreneurs fascinating. So. Yeah. Um, so you have that, that sort of uh, background of, of parents who were, um, you know, on the one hand in, in music and culture, on the other hand in, in education, uh, very strong influences, both, uh, of course, your parents. And then you also had a couple of other people uh, you mentioned to me that were very influential in your, in your life, an uncle and an aunt, and then a couple uh, that worked in the marketing industry in, in Madison right. Avenue in New York. Um, these people were very important to me. Um, like everybody who's listening to uh, this conversation, uh, I had people in my life who, at the time, I wasn't aware that they were mentoring me, but they were. And I uh, have their pictures in my home, and I, I honor them in my thoughts almost every day. Um, one of them was my mother's brother, who was a businessman. And he, took an, he and his wife, uh, my aunt, took an interest in me. And he took me to work. He had a meat uh, distribution company. And um, he would take me to his office several times a year. This is a privilege. Because, you know, I would sit in the corner and play with his notepads and the pens he would give to customers. And, and I would listen. You know, while I'm playing and waiting for lunchtime, uh, I'm listening to what's going on. And if he had to go out into the distribution uh, warehouse, I would go with him. And right. I would see his interaction with people. These are fantastic opportunities for children. They say you, um, you learn with your eyes or you steal with your eyes. But the interesting thing is, that, of course, that children don't know that they're being exposed. They find out later when they go to um, EU University and they're in a business class and they say, oh, yeah, I remember my father did, used to do that when I visited him as, at his office. It's, it, it, it ties together later in life. And my parents also had a, a friends, this is why, why we were still in New York City, who were very much involved in the 1950s, late 1950s, Madison Avenue world. They were both in advertising. Yeah, we know from the series Mad Man, that's sort of right. the- Right, yes, the two, martini, the, the two martini lunch crowd. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they, they also took an interest in me. And I realized uh, uh, later, how much I learned from them about, yeah. well, not only about how they interacted with each other, a married couple, but also about um, how businesses function uh, because right. they would always talk about their clients. And of course, if we look back now uh, at your career, then sort of indeed those influences sort of merge because after college, of course, you worked a few years as a teacher, uh, but then you were sort of a, a restless person. You describe yourself as a, as a startup guy and you started having lunch with these friends to other friends about, you know, should, we should do something, we should do something else, that's right. uh, start up our own business. And that's sort of, uh, uh, that's, that's what you did. Yeah, Gordon Bowker and Jerry Baldwin and I uh, were friends. We started meeting kind of formally, you know, to um, see if we could come up with a way to improve our lives that would give, give us more from life than our first jobs that we each had after graduating college. Um, and, you know, we were just wanted more, something more interesting. And we uh, would meet, uh, oh, you know, every few weeks, talk in between. And finally, at, uh, uh, in August of 1970, we were having lunch together at a little French restaurant. And at the end of the meal, the waiter came back to the table and said, would you gentlemen like to have espresso after your meal? Excellent idea. And, and, and he, that we said yes, and he left. But that was the first time that anyone had offered us an espresso in Seattle. Right. Because the world of coffee that we take for granted today did not exist. You couldn't buy good coffee in Seattle, and nobody had an espresso machine. Um, 
So he came back to the table with the three espressos, you know, and we're kind of interested in them. And uh, we each picked up our little cup and took a sip. And it was terrible. <laughs> it, was just, it was like drinking something that you would pour into the tank of your motorcycle, you know, to make no, it that, perform. a good first experience for an espresso. And, then. Uh, it was really bad. And so the conversation changed from the ideas that we had been talking about, which were not going to work anyway, to, okay, what about coffee? This coffee that we're having here is really terrible. Does, does Seattle have to live with bad coffee? And that was the, the idea. That was the, the spark for, That's where for it Starbucks. All started. Yes. And then, of course, you know, unlike the other times that you had ideas, you actually turned this one into a, a business. Well, but, you, just, but, but just like the other ideas, we researched them. We researched right. each of our ideas. And then very quickly with most of the ideas, we would discover, oh, no, bad idea. Can't do that one. Uh, or maybe it's a good idea for somebody else. We don't know enough to do that. And we started researching coffee, and we never found out why it would be a bad idea. It was and a good idea. <laughs> actually, it turned out to be a good idea. You mentioned the research, and, and you talked a little bit about the division of roles. Um, between the three of you, you were actually the one who really got into that research and said, let me find out what, what good coffee places are actually around that we can maybe learn from. Yes, I did the kind of research people did in the summer of 1970. Uh, it was primitive. It was more like doing research in the 19th century. Uh, Books, no, no, libraries. No, yeah, library. You go to the library and do your research, looking at old newspapers and old telephone books and trying to figure out, are there coffee companies that are any good? And uh, you, you just, it, I know it's hard to imagine, especially for your students, but you couldn't Google anything because there was no internet. Right. Uh, and um, I eventually, during the research, I was doing the phone book research, actually, when I was look, just looking for coffee companies that maybe were at the gourmet end of the spectrum. I found one in San Francisco. It's called Pete's Coffee. It still exists. I know and it. I've I, had Pete's Coffee. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they, there was a phone number. So I called Pete's Coffee and asked to speak to Mr. Pete. I had discovered there was a Mr. Pete. And by some great stroke of luck, they found him and he talked to me on the telephone. I said, oh, Mr. P, it's so nice to talk to you. We're, you know, I'm one of three friends. We're thinking of starting a gourmet coffee company here in Seattle. And before I could finish the sentence, he said, uh, Zev, uh, before you go any further, I think you should come down to San Francisco and look at what's here. I'll show you my stores and I'll take you to my roasting plant. And then you can decide whether you want to be in the coffee business. That's incredible. I mean, like that's you know, this, a competitor. A potential competitor. And, um, you know, I think that uh, this, the students at uh, you and your alumni would understand what a great moment that was. You know, that, that somebody, I did the right thing. I was assertive and called a person who I thought would be an expert. But he did the right thing too. He took an interest in uh, you know, a young man, I was 26 years old, who right. clearly, clearly knew nothing. <laughs> and so I got in my car and went to San Francisco. And you know, it's a long drive. Uh, it's a 12 hour drive at that time. And um, he received me and I looked at his store, which was full of customers and had a wonderful aroma. Uh, it was a retail coffee bean store with a small uh, coffee bar. And uh, then he took me to his roasting clan and we sat there and talked. Um, it was a small little roasting clan, the kind of thing that would occupy not much space. And then he did something, the second thing that changed my life. So he's, he's invited me to come and have a look and he's taken time to talk to me. Now he says, why don't we go out for a glass of wine and a, a little light dinner before you leave? Best idea ever. Oh my God, it was so important to me. Um, so we had a wonderful time. Berkeley has a very nice climate, like, sort of like Barcelona. And um, it, uh, you know, we were outside sipping wine and he discovered that my father was a professional violinist, which he really liked because he was a great fan of uh, classical music. And at the end of the conversation, that was over an hour, a very nice, pleasant time. Remember, I'm 26. He's probably 46. He says, he, he turned to me and he said, 
You know, Sev, if you and your two friends go ahead with this, I'm perfectly willing to be a coach. I'll give, I'll give you some time. That's incredible. This is from heaven. This is, you know, this is what people hope for. This and that's what, what happened. I, I mean, he followed every through. Single, this is what I hope would, would happen to every entrepreneur, that an entrepreneur would say that. Right. And he actually followed through. I mean, like you, you followed, uh, it's almost like an internship, you could say, at his, at his coffee. Yes, first. he had us each come down one at a time uh, and work in a store for a week or 10 days. And then he was available to us uh, by phone. And he actually came to Seattle twice to visit us. Fair to say uh, that uh, there would not have been a Starbucks without uh, Pete's? I think there would have been a Starbucks, but it would not have had the quality standards and the discipline that Mr. Pete instilled in us. He was old school. You have to do it right. You have to go for the top quality. Um, you have to exceed people's expectations. Right. Really excellent. And, um, and so that, you know, that gave you, you had the idea. Now you had the tools. Uh, you were going to be able to bring a good product to market. Um, you know, next step, find a name. What, where did the name Starbucks come oh, from? Oh, this, uh, this is a great story. We did what, what your students would do if they were starting a company. We made lists of names. Right. And the, the, I remember just this tablet full of name after name after name. And finally, the, uh, our attorney said, hey, you guys, that's probably exactly what he said, you have to choose a name now because we have to submit the legal papers. Right. Enough, enough fooling around. <laughs> so we quickly narrowed the list to three or four names. And um, one of the names was Starbo, S-T-A-R-B-O. And another was Steamers, uh, evoking the era of steamships. And somebody blurted out, Starbo, st Steamers, how about Starbucks? Wow. And that was it. And everybody said, oh, yeah, Starbucks, that's a great name. It was just very impulsive at that time. Done. Now, the logo was different. The famous mermaid logo. Um, I have a, an old uh, Starbucks cup here with the original logo. Nice. And the mermaid is still part of the Starbucks uh, green logo that you see today. And she was um, a stroke of genius by our uh, outside uh, marketing consultant, a man named Terry Heckler. And he, he, it was really insightful. His firm came up with the logo and the, the original logo and the, uh, the mermaid. And he also uh, redid the, green, uh, the logo to be the green logo for uh, the company when it evolved later. Yeah. And so, uh, so he came up just, you know, with, of course, what has become an iconic uh, uh, logo. What was, somebody's asking, what was actually the, the meaning behind the word Starbucks? Nothing, just a play of words. Um, it, Gordon Bowker, uh, one of the three founders, was trying to create, an, uh, in his marketing thinking, uh, was trying to create a company that people would think had been in existence forever, that it was maybe a very old company. <laughs> Um, and we didn't tell people, you know, we, we were a new company and everybody knew that, but he wanted the imagery to be old. So he, we all thought that the name contributed to that. There were some historical allusions to that word, Starbucks. We didn't invent the word. It, right. It just and it was certainly uh, a, a sort of a, uh, your startup, of course, but really in the, in the physical sense of the word, uh, you know, when the next step came, it was time to go and build, almost literally build your first store. Uh, oh, yes. Um, you know, Starbucks founders were like many entrepreneurs today, people in the tech fields, for instance. You know, you're working for a big corporation. You have a great idea for some piece of software that's, that the world needs. And you, you start out to do it. Well, you know, you work, uh, you do what's called sweat equity. You compose um, the code at night and on weekends when you're not working at your day job. And well, that's what we did. We, we were undercapitalized. The, the three founders of Starbucks contributed $9,000, 9,000 US dollars in 1970 um, to start the company. It's very little money. And, but what we did contribute is a lot of sweat equity. We built the first store by hand ourselves, all right. the fixtures, um, we painted everything, um, we did lots of additional work. We did everything that we could because we couldn't afford to pay anybody else to do it. No, but you but must have been a handyman. 
uh, that was only the first door. Well, we were definitely amateurs. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's how we were able to do it. Then in the second year, as we started to expand, we realized uh, that we needed money. By the way, the reason we realized that we needed money from outside was because we ran out of money. <laughs> and, um, but the first store had been quite a success and uh, some local uh, uh, guys who my partner, Jerry Baldwin, knew said, okay, we'll help you. And we sold them 15 or 20% of the stock. And they were the only investors that the founders allowed into the company. Wow. For the next uh, what decade. What a great investment. For, on their part, yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for the next decade, we were able to grow by reinvesting profits. The coffee business is a profitable business. And also by borrowing against assets like our coffee inventory. So we, right. used, we used retained earnings and uh, debt to grow the company into the 1980s. But so now, this is that, that was possible because we, we did not try to grow outside of Seattle. Right. And so, you know, initially, you know, you build a, a company. It's actually successful from the start, isn't it? I mean, like you have a good product, you have a nice look and feel to it, um, and you get a great uh, training from a, from a great mentor. And people, people like good coffee, who knew, right, even in Seattle. And so you're yeah, able to expand quickly. Well, it's wonderful when the products that you're competing against, which is, you know, commercial coffee from supermarkets and in restaurants, it was so terrible then that it was easy to convert customers if they would come and visit us. So when they came in the door, the first thing they got was this wonderful aroma. The whole store just had a fabulous aroma to it. And as they came toward the counter, we would give them a sample of whatever coffee we were brewing, like a, a Harar from Ethiopia. Sure. Uh, and they, they, in these little tiny cups, we didn't sell coffee then brewed coffee. We only gave it away a sample. It was a different so they, type they of would take store. A sip and they, they would take a sip of this really high quality coffee and say, what's this? This doesn't taste like the coffee that I, I've been drinking. And then we would use that as an opening or, uh, to explain to them that there was a difference. <laughs> That's great. I've always wondered if it was like a sort of a side business in addition uh, to the Starbucks uh, brand that they have. You have next to the, the counter, you always have like, you can buy some beans, but actually that was the original Starbucks. You were a right. those bags you of beans, coffee. Those bags of beans that you see in Starbucks stores all over the world are actually how the company began. That's correct, Peter. Yeah. And so you grew it over the next decade or so from uh, one store that you built, hand built yourself to um, you know, oh, uh, six stores and I think two coffee roasting plants in, in the Seattle area. Yeah, we had a small roasting plant, which we then closed and opened a really state-of-the-art roasting plant, uh, which carried us into the 1980s. And uh, we also had 300 wholesale accounts. And this is a very interesting thing. There was a symbiotic relationship between our retail B2C business and our B2B sales to restaurants. restaurants. People would go to a restaurant, they'd have a great cup of coffee. It would say on the menu, coffee by Starbucks. And then they would say, oh, Starbucks, I've heard of them. There's a store near me. I think I'll go there and get some coffee. Right. And, and the two worked really well together. So but you we were, were only in Seattle. This was a, 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 not, a, not even a regional company. It was in one city. In one city. Now, it seems like, you know, you're onto something. You're, you're growing quite, quite well in the first decade. You're actually a vice president. You're the first employee of the company. You do a lot of different roles. You're in charge mm -hmm. of uh, employee management. Um, uh, you know, you, you sort of, you're the clue that keeps everything together. Why would anyone ever want to leave a company like that? Well, I was the first to leave. Um, uh, my partner stayed three years longer than I did. Um, I, I'm a startup guy, uh, and I mean, I know who I am. I'm an early stage entrepreneur. I have been all my life, um, and I also like to help people who are just like that, people like you mentioned, Jesse Ackermans. Uh, she's starting a company. I'm working with her on that. Um, the, the moment came when my partners said to me, Zev, we have this fantastic coffee roasting business. We have wholesale sales. We have retail sales. We think we can grow it further. And you keep opening new divisions of the company, a tea division, a supermarket division, this division, that division. And that's very nice. But those divisions 
are not as profitable as their core business. So we, right. we want you to stop doing that. And I thought about it and said, oh, I don't think I can stop. I, I, I need, that's just me. That's my DNA. I'm an entrepreneur. And uh, they agreed to buy me out. So I sold my stock. I was very happy about that. I suddenly had a lot of money. Uh, and um, I went on and immediately opened another company, which sold equipment to coffee companies. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I continued to do that for 20 years after that. And of course, you were, uh, you've proven to be a, a real serial startup uh, entrepreneur, as they say. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on. But it's uh, quite remarkable because just about a year or so after you left the company, um, uh, there was a new guy that, uh, that uh, appeared, <laughs> a new kid on the block. That was, yeah, the new uh, kid on the block. That's Howard Schultz. Uh, that's a very, very nice description of him. So Howard Schultz became um, aware of Starbucks because Starbucks was a customer of the company that he was vice president of. It was a company called Hammerplast, which sold uh, uh, very attractive plastic tableware, including coffee thermoses and brewing equipment um, all over the world including to Starbucks. So he, as vice president of sales, uh, in a, must have been about 1982, he made a Western tour, you know, California, Oregon, uh, and, see, and Washington to see his customers. And he was curious about Starbucks because we were selling a lot of thermoses uh, to people for brewing coffee. And that was the first visit. And that led to Howard uh, and his wife moving to Seattle, and uh, he became vice president for sales and marketing of Starbucks Coffee Company. Everybody in the world would say that he was a very good hire. Right, that I'm sure. He was exceptional, uh, a really great communicator, a, a good salesman, but also a good marketer. And uh, several things happened during the next two years. Starbucks began to experiment just a little bit with espresso, selling coffee beverages in our stores. At the same time, Howard Schultz was sent to Italy to go to a big trade show in Milan. There are still big trade shows in Milan, or there will be after COVID. And the famous Italy trip. And yes, the famous Italy trip. He's written about it extensively. And he experienced what everyone experiences when they go to Italy. There's espresso on every corner. And it's great. You know, he got off the, you know, he got off the airplane and there's espresso right in the airport. And um, so when he came back, he explained to the partners that he felt that we should pursue coffee with um, a lot of energy, but brewed coffee, espresso-based drinks. And Starbucks experiments with uh, coffee expanded and uh, eventually, uh, uh, Howard Schultz came to the founders with the help of some angel investors that he knew in Seattle, not venture capital at that time, angel investors, and asked if he could purchase the company from the founders and well, from the surviving founders. That would be Gordon Bowker and Jerry Baldwin. And unbeknownst to Mr. Schultz, they were ready to sell. Um, they, so they, a, a negotiation began and eventually Mr. Schultz and his group of angels acquired the company and they immediately began to turn it into the company that we know today. And so that begs in the question, you know, if uh, yourself and, and your co-founders uh, led uh, sort of left uh, before the global success really took off, you know, at that point, it doesn't sound all too dissimilar from the story of the McDonald's brothers uh, who had Ray Kroc come in. Uh, yeah, but, unlo but unlike, uh, unlike the McDonald brothers, we weren't sorry. <laughs> right. Because that's, that's the Donald brothers are famous for, for, for feeling that they um, had been taken advantage of. And, and you could, of course, you know, if you, if you purely look at the financials, you could say, well, you know, I could have been a multi-billionaire. Uh, and of course I had a nice life. Why is it that you were saying I have no regrets? Oh, I personally, uh, I have no regrets at all. And I don't think my partners do either. Um, I'm a startup guy. I, I am not a person who's very comfortable in a company with 100 employees, let alone right. thousands. Um, and 
I, I'm, I'm good at the early stage, putting things together, financing, um, and uh, I'm not good in a large organization. So I'm completely content with leaving an organization, uh, I've done this more than once, uh, at a time when my comfort zone has been reached, the, the limits of my comfort. So and I'm, but, it's but not always about it. all about the money. I mean, like you can be happy, content, you say. Uh, oh, absolutely. E if you know who you are, and, and I do I know who I am, um, you can be content if you're following your own life plan. Now, how do I feel about uh, the Starbucks of today, you know, 32,000 stores, uh, 78 countries. <laughs> uh, it's amazing to me. And it's all still very high quality, um, which is really impressive. I feel really happy. Um, you know, it's like seeing your, um, your child turn your child. into one of the greatest people on earth. You know, um, the, the impact on, uh, on, on myself and on the rest of the world from Starbucks is, is a very positive one. Right. And uh, uh, it, I'm thrilled that uh, a man like Howard Schultz was present and wanted to do this. Just as of course you had the good fortune of meeting somebody like Alfred Pete and being able to learn from him. Um, uh, you know, it's sort of like you pass that on and you say, you know, sometimes you don't only have to think about money. You don't only have to think about competitors and beating them. Sometimes satisfaction can lie in learning from each other and being happy for each other's successes. I'm in complete agreement with that thought. Uh, I certainly am, am a happy guy. Uh, uh, not only do I get to talk to you uh, and to share my story with the community around EU University, but I also um, work with a considerable uh, number of uh, young entrepreneurs and I get to hear their stories. They're, they're my teachers. Yeah. Uh, I learn every day from uh, people that I mentor uh, and they're in and many countries now. And we're going to hear from a couple of them uh, now that you mention it in just a minute. Um, we've learned already a lot from you, but one of the questions that we had to ask you, uh, of course, being such a specialist in coffee, is what is the best coffee that Ziff Siegel, the founder of Starbucks, has ever had? Well, I, I, you know, there's so much great coffee now. Every year, more interesting uh, ways of brewing and uh, the quality of the agricultural end of the coffee business. I like to think of coffee as an experience. It's the, the quality of the coffee plus everything that goes with it. Where, you know, for instance, if you're in a coffee bar, what's it like? What's the barista like? And to me, the best experience that I've ever had was in a really unusual place. I, uh, I had a speaking engagement in Johannesburg. And while I was there, um, I went to Cape Town, which is a marvelous destination to go to. If it wasn't so far away, more people would go to it. Um, and while I was there, uh, I stayed uh, two nights in a, a, a what's called a black township. Uh, these are segregated areas where only black people live. And they are attached to every city in Johannesburg still in spite of the fact that um, apartheid has ended. So I was visiting this uh, township, being shown around, um, it's fascinating. And we went to the, this particular township was called Kailisha. And we went to the center of the township where there is a supermarket and a big pharmacy and uh, also a train station for a commuter train. And at the train station, which was outdoors, not, not an enclosed area, there was a coffee company called the Department of Coffee. The name is a joke because <laughs> there's a department Ministry of or... everything. There's a, yeah, there's a department of everything in South Africa. So this is the Department of Coffee. It's a tiny little espresso, takeout espresso bar. And the owner refers to himself as the Minister of Coffee. Another hilarious joke. Excellent. Uh, and his name is Wogama Galeni. And he's a young uh, black African who lives in Kailicha. And he's a classic entrepreneur story. 
He had been helped by a development bank. He had uh, attended classes in a program for first-time entrepreneurs. I mean, he's the the perfect guy. And he was trying to get uh, black Africans at this train station to get interested in espresso-based drinks. And it was very difficult. He survived, but it was very difficult at first. And uh, I tell you, standing outside of his place, I have photographs from it, standing outside of his little coffee bar, with uh, Wagama, the you know the minister of coffee, uh, talking about the coffee business, it was one of the high points of my life. <laughs> I mean, it was excellent. so so completely radical and amazing to me. And and of course, very different experience to Starbucks. We're going to turn to questions uh, now from students, uh, Zef, if that's okay. And and Please. before uh, we do, just one question from a student online. What was the original Starbucks and where is it? Are you close to it now? The original Starbucks is about um, a kilometer from where I'm sitting. Uh, It's in the Pike Place Market. It still exists. Uh, Instead of being a coffee bean store, it it is now a coffee bar. It is also a major tourist destination, particularly for Starbucks fans from Asia, Japan, Korea, China, uh, who wait in line outside of the store for a chance to take a selfie of themselves. And if you... uh, the people who are listening to this uh, afterwards, you can just Google Starbucks original location or Starbucks first store, and you will find 1 million photographs, all <laughs> selfies of people from all over the world. It's, it's a excellent. fascinating place. And uh, by the way, even though it has 37,000 uh, stores all over the world, there's still a lot of places where there's no Starbucks. And a lot of people are also asking how they can open a Starbucks store. I'm well, sure it's we can. Well, very interesting. St- Starbucks doesn't franchise. Um, so you can't open a Starbucks store. Uh, you can open an independent coffee bar. That's a possibility. Um, right. Lots of people compete with Starbucks in every city on the planet. Often with the same uh, logo or similar logos and styles. Uh, actually, if you want to get a phone call really quickly, uh, copy Starbucks logo. They have people that watch the internet all the time. <laughs> <laughs> They're very jealous. Um, so, um, yeah, it is possible to compete with Starbucks. Uh, the way Starbucks grew internationally was through joint ventures. Um, there's a joint venture in Europe. There's one in Eastern Europe. There's one in the Gulf region. There's one in Japan, et cetera. Starbucks forms a joint venture corporation with a local company that understands food and beverage retail. That's, that's how they do it. So they take advantage of local expertise. For instance, in India, where some of your people are listening right now, their joint venture partner is Tata, which itself is a giant corporation. That's right. So that's the, uh, the way to do it. Well, we'll see if it's possible for some of our students to be one day partner with Starbucks. I want to turn to Mia. Mia, who's from Turkmenistan, but right now in Frankfurt in Germany. And Mia, you had a question about the environmental impact yeah. of uh, Starbucks and, and, and entrepreneurs in general. Yeah, hello, everyone. At first, I want to say it's a great honor to participate in this event. So my question is, so Starbucks focuses on um, environmental sustainability, like they sell in reusable caps and also shifting to their uh, recycled uh, packaging. So which trends uh, in the environmental sustainability you can uh, highlight? Now, remember, Mia, uh, I, am, I am not part of Starbucks today, but I am an observer yeah. of the coffee yeah. industry, and I'm quite up to date. Um, the coffee bar industry, which is how the coffee industry has evolved, has become mostly a, a to-go beverage kind of industry. Um, it has a tremendous problem uh, with in, uh, environmental uh, uh, compliance. It is a tragedy that there still isn't a widely uh, available to-go coffee cup that can be recycled. Yeah. The, the reason is, the, excuse me, the cold drink cups, the, pl- the clear plastic cups, in many parts of the world, those can be recycled. Not a problem. Mm-hmm. And they are. The hot coffee cups, the ones that look like paper, are actually lined with a coating so that the paper can survive the hot drink. Those cups are not recyclable. And there are billions of them sold every year. This is something that the coffee industry is trying to solve, but so far there is no solution. And (laughs) I would say that 
the EU grad, graduate who solves that problem is going to make a fortune. Uh, so the, it's not so great. Now, there are other types of packaging that Starbucks uses um, that, are re that is recyclable. And starting about 15 years ago, Starbucks started using recycled um, products, especially recycled lumber from old buildings as uh, part of the interiors of their stores and if, uh, as part of their contribution to not doing damage to the environment. But the coffee industry has, has a problem. Yeah. Uh, now at the agricultural level, Starbucks is, and other companies, there, Starbucks is not alone, are doing wonderful work with farmers that uh, redu has reduced, or in so many cases, eliminated the use of uh, commercial fertilizers. Uh, so at that end, you know, I think the coffee industry has done good work. But uh, the coffee cups, it's time for someone to invent one. <laughs> right. It's a great startup idea. Um, and that perhaps already answers uh, to a certain degree the next question mm -hmm. from Tushar, Tushar uh, Kanti, who's in uh, India. Tushar, go ahead. Firstly, uh, uh, firstly, I would like to thank you, Mr. Seal, for sharing your inspiring experiences with all of us. So my question for you is if you were a graduate today just like most of us who are watching you today in what product line or services would you have launched your startup in well you know for any any new company there has to be demand it doesn't work very well to have an idea that has no market um, you can starve trying to make that happen um, so I would say that the, one of the most important things is to understand the customer's point of view. And I'm not thinking just of consumer products, but also a business to business product, like say software. Um, it, it's important to understand where, you know, one expression that I love is where their pain is. What are they suffering from? Um, I have a, a man that I help uh, occasionally who has a company that provides software to microlenders in the United States. Microlenders are not just in other countries. We also have them here. And he supplies uh, uh, one third of the microlenders in the United States with the software that they use to make loans. And the reason he was able to get so much of the market, one out of every three customers, um, was, was because he realized that the, the the pressure point for them was that they had to go back to their office to get on their um, computers to finish up the loan documents. So he, his company was the first company to put um, all of the uh, program online. So now you have micro lenders, um, you know, out in the field talking to a farmer, they've got their, com their portable computer on the hood of the car and they're making the loan right there his competitors still can't do that. And so there's an example. He understood the pressure point, the pain, and, and he took care of it by uh, creating a system that would work in, in, the, um, in the ethernet. Another thing that he does, and I th I'm just using him as an example, um, is he exceeds customer expectations. So he has these you know, hundreds and hundreds of micro lenders signed up and they're using his software online. Um, and then the COVID virus hit. In the United States, the government made money available to small businesses. Some of these businesses were the customers of the micro lenders. They qualified to get these micro loans to help them get through, to retain their employees to, and help them get through the, the crisis. So his, the use of his system skyrocketed. It just went, went nuts. And he brought in extra people and was helping by phone and by uh, uh, text and email to make sure that the system was working for them. And I think as a result of that, he's, so this is exceeding expectations. So in a crisis for them, for his customers, he exceeded their expectations. Now, I would think that that's going to result in him soon having 40% of the market instead of just 30%. Because word is going to get out around the, the world of micro lenders that 
this guy and his company is the one that's going to be there for you when things are tough. So th those right. are some, some, some ways that uh, startups and actually existing companies um, can connect with their customers. Excellent. Yeah, it's also a question, of course, thank you, Tisha, for that question. And it's also a question that's relevant particularly today, uh, Zef. Of course, you are living in an exceptional time. And so, um, Carolina, I think uh, you have a question, Carolina, who's from Portugal, but right now in Dublin, Ireland. I think you have a question about what it means to be an entrepreneurship entrepreneur today uh, and the impact of the coronavirus. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, it's correct. I actually wanted to capture what Mr. Zapp started the topic with COVID. Um, uh, as an innovator and you're, you're a vision, business visionary, what would you say it's the essential for business to adapt to this post-pandemic period? Well, this is a, tr a difficult time for business, uh, I, which is why you're asking the question, Carolina. Um, <laughs> it's really... Uh, the game has changed. So there are a number of things that are, are still possible now. Most businesses that have to do with a product that's uh, sold online or uh, is a software product or a phone application are going ahead. That, that includes, by the way, the, the EU graduate that we were talking about before, Jesse Ackerman, her product, her company's proceeding to get financed, we hope, um, because it is an on, it's an online platform driven by a phone app. Um, uh, just a minute. Robin. Um, the, um, the other aspect is assets are going to be available at an extremely low cost. So it's going to be possible uh, to acquire uh, existing businesses of all types, distributorships, retail, all kinds of companies, and grow them after the, the virus has been managed with a vaccine. Um, it's going to be possible to enter a business at a low cost by acquiring assets. Now, I recognize that that means that somebody else uh, has had to give up their assets at a price far lower than they had expected, but it is, um, it's a reality. Also, I would advise anyone to, uh, especially for a startup, to think in terms of a niche, a narrow um, area that's been overlooked. Um, there are, every day people start companies like this. Oh, well, let's go back to the example of the man who's providing software to, um, uh, micro lenders. I mean, who would think that that would be a business providing software to micro lenders, but it is a business. It's a nice business for him. Um, and, uh, it's, a, it's also becoming a valuable business. So when he wants to sell, when he's, when he's in his uh, early sixties, uh, when he wants to sell, it's going to be uh, an asset that will uh, make his retirement absolutely terrific. Um, so th these are some aspects of the, uh, of what is a very unpleasant time for, for business owners. Niches, buying assets at, at low cost and repositioning the companies. That's um, very good advice. And you know, to build a little bit on that, I think uh, a couple of questions also, Ziff, from people in the chat. Um, people asking, for example, uh, Lena, she's asking, if you were still at Starbucks today, uh, what would you be doing different? Well, if I were still at Starbucks today, <clears throat> I would be starting new divisions because that's what I do. Um, but trying to step back into the zone that Lena is asking the question about, um, what do I think Starbucks could do today? There are a couple of things. Um, I have been mystified why Starbucks has no presence at all in the world of chocolate. Uh, they have a fabulous brand identity. They would know how to um, uh, develop a, a line of uh, chocolate products that would be fabulous, or they could acquire a company, but they don't do it. I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Why? Um, in terms of other areas, for instance, beverages, they have a, a development lab. It's here in Seattle um, where they're constantly developing new products. 
that um, many of which sell quite well when they're brought out. Uh, variations on um, herb teas that have beautiful color and they're served ice and attract a lot of attention. And they're still able to develop new coffee products, which really amazes me because you would think after 400 years of coffee that we would be done with new products. But uh, coffee, companies, but chocolate, coffee companies continue to develop them. Chocolate, of course, a great example. And indeed sounds like it's very uh, complementary, at least in terms of its product with uh, coffee. Other people are asking like Toshiro, um, asking more about the soft skills that you need as an entrepreneur. What do you think is the most important soft skill to, that you need to succeed? Well, I think there, <clears throat> there are two, Toshiro. Um, number one, an open mind. Um, if you find that you're having conversations with people about your business idea and the other person does all the listening, that's probably not a good sign. <laughs> um, the entrepreneur needs to have an, an, a, you know, a certain level of uh, assertiveness and, a, and good ideas, but they also have to have the ability to listen. Fortunately, my partners and I uh, had that particular skill and, and we listened to a lot of people. We didn't accept everything that they said, but we certainly welcomed their ideas. The other thing is an openness to uh, financial forecasting. Uh, this is really significant, and it's something that I have learned over many, many years. Um, I don't think we would be having this conversation if Jerry Baldwin hadn't been one of my partners. And why is that? Well, he's a nice guy, smart, and fun to be with, but Jerry also developed very quickly into a, uh, a first-rate financial executive. Even in our second year and, beyond, and from then on, we, we knew what our financial position was and we knew what, was probably, what it was probably going to be 30 days from now. Well, I think that uh, in my experience with hundreds of startup entrepreneurs, many of them have no idea what their financial position is. Um, so what if you are just, uh, uh, what, uh, <laughs> what people sometimes say to me is, you know, Zev, uh, I have a great idea and I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm just not a numbers guy. I just don't like doing the numbers. Well, you know, that's not the greatest sin in the world. Uh, you can survive, but you have to then say in the next sentence, I'm not a numbers person, but I have this consultant or a, a partner who is the numbers person. And that person is the one I'm going to listen to. Right. It is not okay to begin a company and take money from your family and then later from angel investors and not have a deep understanding of how um, financial spreadsheets work. It's, uh, you point to a number of important uh, points. This is really just a core skill that you need. Um, I saw some interesting reaction from Ricardo who uh, put out two sort of uh, conundrums or two uh, uh, things you to choose from. If you had to choose, if you're a startup uh, entrepreneur, would you choose for money? Or would you choose for vision? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Ricardo, my, my experience is that the, there are three reasons why people start companies. There are more than that, but there are three main reasons. The two you mentioned, the, the feeling that you could um, do well for yourself financially, and another is a vision, uh, but uh, I would call that an insight into an industry. But there's another thing, which is self-actualization. A lot of people who start, want to start a company want to have the experience of creating something. And, you know, they're not a, a fine artist and they're, you know, not a musician, so they create a business. Um, and that self actualization is I think the desire for self-actualization I think is a pretty important factor another one is if, uh, if you're working for a large organization is the opportunity to be your own boss um, but that comes with a caveat which is <clears throat> being your own boss doesn't mean being a dictator to the people who are around you it means listening to them and thinking about their needs you know you're, you're your partners, your staff, your customers. So being the boss, you know, numero uno, uh, does, does not mean that you are a dictator. 
Right. So you clearly uh, need to have some empathy as well. Um, a, a second uh, conundrum that uh, Ricardo wanted to put forward, I think it's also an interesting one. If you look at your, your partners, the people that you co-found a company with, what's more important? Competency, you mentioned that, or trust, the fact that you can trust them. So Ricardo, you have hit on a very um, sensitive and interesting point. We were friends. And our, as we started to have our conversations when we were 26 years old, um, I think what we learned about each other is that we were kind of well-adjusted people. Uh, n none of us were, had, uh, had any degree of craziness about us. Uh, and we, were, you know, we, were, we, we got along very well with each other. And I think that our ability to cooperate and to listen to each other was really important. And the other aspect, and this is, you know, I, I, you know you, my theory, theory is you create your own luck. Um, I think we were a little bit lucky because as it turned out, I uh, was a very good startup person. I could handle a lot of tension and uh, do a lot of things at the same time. Um, Gordon Bowker was a deep thinker about um, how to position a company in, in, in a marketplace. And he did that for other companies too. Um, and then Jerry Baldwin evolved into uh, an excellent leader and a fabulous financial executive. Um, so we had a lot of area, important areas covered from early on. Um, and Starbucks you know, looked pretty good to our customers, uh, both wholesale and retail, because of that. Uh, right. The combination of talent was enormous. So you have the right uh, partners or you discovered over time what were your uh, top skills and how you could best work together. Somebody's also asking, Roman, um, if you also had failures uh, also in those early years at Starbucks and perhaps uh, in the interest of learning from you, uh, you well, know, could you share one of those stories? Roman, what a great question. Uh, I think everybody's going to benefit from you asking that question. Yes, within Starbucks, we did have some failures. I, I can describe three of them to you. Um, I, uh, we wanted to sell coffee in supermarkets, just like you see in many parts of the world today. Uh, a coffee grinder, bins of coffee, or bags of coffee. Uh, but we wanted really high quality, uh, which was not available. So we started a sub-brand. It was called Blue Anchor Coffee. And we got local two important supermarket chains, grocery chains, to let us install these departments. They were quite attractive. And our customers started buying the coffee, but an unforeseen problem happened. A smarter, more experienced entrepreneur would have seen this coming, but we didn't see it coming. The buyers for the supermarket chains, the executives, as soon as we got set up, started pressuring us to lower our prices. From their point of view, they had let us in to their stores and they knew that we had invested in that. And now they thought, well, we, now we can get these guys to lower their prices because that's what supermarket chains do. They go after their vendors to get them to do that. But we couldn't lower our prices. We were operating very efficiently, but our coffee was really expensive. We paid a high price for the green coffee that we then roasted for the grocery stores. So within 18 months, um, we had to sell our uh, supermarket division, the Blue Anchor Coffee, um, to another company that had just begun opening uh, supermarket uh, departments, uh, but they, were, they weren't as quality conscious as we were. So we sold them all of our locations and our equipment and got out of that business because we just, we just could not, play the price game with supermarkets. We should have known that, that was a mistake. Um, uh, number two, we thought uh, in our forecast, you know, all entrepreneurs do financial forecasts. And I certainly encourage that. And we, try, we refined our forecast and improved them. And, um, and we forecasted uh, that about uh, 15 to 20% of our sales would be in the fine uh, leaf teas from all over the world that we were offering. Um, offering in our own packaging, by the way. So 
15 to 20 percent of our sales forecast as uh, T. The actual number, two and a half percent. Wow. It, it never reached three percent. We were just, we had T, you know, uh, in excess in our warehouse because we had purchased as though a significant portion of our sales were going to be T. I don't think we could have known that was going to happen. Um, but it did, and it was a mistake, and we had to gradually sell off our tea inventory. We and continued Starbucks to could have known it later because I think uh, Tivana was an adventure that they set up so many years later and made. It well, seemed they, like acqu the same they acquired, thing. yeah, they acquired Tivana to get into the tea business. But a lot of people think that it wasn't a very successful uh, right. acquisition compared to some of their others. Um, and then uh, the third mistake that we made. <clears throat> this is. Uh, this is a gray area. It's not so clear. I mentioned that Starbucks started experimenting with coffee bars in 19, about 1981 it began. And then when Howard Schultz became part of the company, the, the, the experiments expanded and uh, it went pretty well. Now, for sure, we could not have opened a coffee bar within our first store in, 19, in March of 1971 when we first opened the store in the Pike Place Market in Seattle. But I have been asking myself, could we have opened coffee bars, say, in 1978 or 1976? And I think the answer is we probably could have. But we didn't. We, we actually had conversations about this, and we decided not to because we were selling to the first coffee carts and coffee bars that were opening in Seattle at that time. They were our customers. Right. And we decided that for now, this is you know the late 1970s. We'll just host, we'll be a wholesaler to those guys, and we'll watch them grow. Um, looking back and seeing what happened by 1990, say in the coffee bar industry, they were spreading all over the world. Maybe we could have done that earlier. Uh, so those are three areas where our vision wasn't so accurate. Right. So and those. Thank are you, Ricardo. Thank you, Ricardo, for asking that question. Yeah, no, it's an absolutely an excellent question. I'm looking at the clock and I'm afraid, um, you know, we already ran out of time a long time ago. People keep on asking questions. We are going to wrap up. Of course, I do want to give one final word to you, uh, a thing that we also started with in the beginning. Uh, somebody's asking, um, you know, you see all the social divisions right now in the U.S. and other places. Uh, you seem like a very sensible person, uh, very uh, uh, aware of other people. What do you think uh, is something we can do to solve those uh, divisions? It's going to be difficult uh, to move from the relationships among various peoples that we have now to a more ideal world because of many factors. But uh, clearly, um, equal opportunity in education and in employment is where we've got to go. Uh, not, not to the degree that we have it now, but more. And it's going to be painful for people of privilege, uh, people like me and you, Peter. Um, we have advantages that um, many other people don't have due to their economic situation or their race. And we're just going to have to uh, persuade those in power to give more opportunity to people who are lacking the power to get what they need. Yep. I think that's very sensible. And by the way, that was a question from Isabel Molina, uh, who is in Houston, Texas. Um, Ziff, thank you so much for all the wisdom that you've shared with us, the time that you've given us, uh, the advice that you've given us. I recall a lot of things. I think many people will be talking about this and thinking about this conversation for many days and weeks and months and years to come. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for your time and your wise words. You are welcome. It was an honor to be asked and uh, I try my best to help organizations that are helping entrepreneurs. Um, we couldn't be more fortunate than to have you and um, I want to now perhaps for a final word turn to, of course to uh, Luc Kran, the managing director of the school. Thank you again, Zef. Yes, thank you very much Zef for, for joining us. Um, and, and uh, sharing your, your vision and inspiring our students. Final shout out as well uh, to Jessie, who has been listening to us. She's on the chat. Thank you very much for, for the connection, for connecting Zef to EU Business School. 
Um, it's highly appreciated. I think the students really enjoyed, enjoyed the talk. They learned a lot. So, Zef, if you want to come back one time, you're more than welcome. Might it be virtual? Might it be on one of our campuses? We'll always welcome you with open arms. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us. Next session already from the Learning from Leader series is next week, uh, June 30th, with uh, Julian Tornare, the CEO of Zenit Watches, a luxury brand, Swiss watch. Uh, one of the protégés of Jean-Claude Biver, who was part of the Learning from Leader series already. Have a safe evening, have a nice day for you, Zef, uh, back in Seattle, and see you next time. Thank you very much. Good luck.